and the chairman of Executive Jet Aviation, you've all seen the Lears with the white uh, fuselage and the pretty red and blue stripes come in here a lot <clears throat> and elsewhere, I'm sure. But really, to uh, introduce this gentleman, I'd like to call on one of our own members uh, who is uh, mainly responsible for uh, having General Tibbetts come down and honor us with his visit. Uh, this man flew with him in North Africa, and he promised to make his introductory remarks in three minutes. So time him, and if three minutes go by, hold up your hand and he'll stop. But to introduce General Tibbetts and his wife, I'd like to give you uh, Ed Hicks of Moore, Dr. Ed Hicks of Moorhead, Kentucky. Yeah. General, Mrs. Tibbetts. Dr. Gumbert, and members of the Kentucky Aviation History Roundtable, guests, ladies and gentlemen, to be awarded the honor of presenting General Tibbetts to this fine audience is the opportunity to participate in a labor of love, the love of our old Air Force unit, the 97th Bombardment Group, and we still like to believe it was the first and still the finest. It seems a certainty that the majority of you remember our guest's name with the action that occurred that August afternoon over Hiroshima. But this evening, I'm hoping that this brief introduction will be accepted as a prologue to General Tibbetts' career and the style in which we of the 97th group remember him. We first saw him as a young captain attempting to whip a squadron into shape from a mixture of regulars, draftees, and second lieutenants, while instructing fledgling pilots how to handle a four-engine aircraft. We also remember another August afternoon, this time in 1942, when as a pilot of Flying Fortress number 2578, he led the first flight of American crewed B-17s over the continent. Between missions over Europe, he also ran a ferry service to Gibraltar, first with General Clark and later with General Dwight Eisenhower. A week later, a touch of excitement was added at Maison Blanc Aerodrome in Algiers when Paul touched down with General Clark. A stick of bombs missed the Red Gremlin by a margin of 100 feet. Two nights later, the Luftwaffe returned, and the blasts of one bomb removed Major Tibbets from his stool in the operations shack. Other bombs destroyed two B-17s on dispersal points. November the 16th saw another first, the initial attack on Bizerta by Allied aircraft. The flight consisted of B seven, six B-17s, led once again by Paul Tibbets. On this new front, bombing missions came with regularity until the lack of supplies and protection for the base caused the group to move to Tafferoy Airfield near Oran. The rainy season made the area famous for GIs wrote poems about the brand of mud that was found at Old Oran. Lacking both basic equipment and ground crews, the air crews did it all, even handing up five-gallon cans of gasoline to the men on the wings until 2,780 gallons filled the tanks. The cans were then used for patching flak holes, which began appearing with great regularity. It was considered good news when orders arrived sending the group to Biskra in the desert south of the Atlas Mountains. The field was fine for three planes could take off a breath, but the bad news was that the supply department issued dust respirators to the ground crews. It was at Biskra, the land of scorpions, sandstorms, a shortage of supplies, and more work than one thought possible that Paul Tibbets would bid us farewell. As the most experienced airman in the American forces, 
General Doolittle Beckett. Now the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, Paul headed the operations staff for the 12th Bird Command. It has been a long journey from the Garden of Allah at Biskra to the heart of the brass. But Paul is here this evening to tell us of the many twists and turns along the way. So it is with pride and pleasure that I present to you General Paul W. Pitts. Paul. Thank you very much. Ed, uh, I'm uh, very appreciative of the introduction, but maybe you are confirming to these people what I was about to tell them, and that is that, uh, in case you didn't know it, you're looking at a, a drunkard, a man that's crazy, that's been in a monastery, a recluse, all kinds of things. Now, all of those come from our good friends over in Russia as a pro part of the disinformation that they started with in about 1951. Uh, sometimes looking back and listening, I, uh, I really wonder if I did have good sense. Now, we're, uh, Andrea and I are both d delighted to be here. I am particularly delighted because of my association with the things that you people uh, believe in, namely airplanes flying and all that goes with it. I told the good doctor that I have no formal type of a speech to make. I don't believe in that. I'm going to say a few things I hope will spark some kind of curiosity in the different minds that are out here in front of me, and then I'll roll up my sleeves and we'll start going at the questions and answers, because I would rather tell you what you want to hear than what I think you should hear. So let's start. I'll go back and as far as 1933. 1933, I was in the University of Florida pre-med school, and I had such a desire to fly airplanes that I began to wonder why I was doing it. When I came up to Cincinnati and got in med school up there after one <coughs> one semester, one term of it, I, I knew that airplanes were for me. The bug had bitten. I had disobeyed my father, which I normally didn't do too much because he had determined I was going to be a doctor. He would never let me get near an airplane or a motorcycle because he said the only thing that scared him in World War I was a ride in a sidecar of a dispatch motorcycle and the other was a flight in an airplane. <laughs> and he knew that, you know, anybody that did Either one of those things was absolutely crazy, and he didn't want, you know, his son to be identified as one of those crazy kids. Well, the bug had been, because I'd been bootlegging a little bit flying time off of a guy that had a J3 Cub, and uh, I got really serious about it. I was lucky enough that my father gave me a pretty good allowance, and I kept using a large part of that allowance. I didn't buy too much gasoline from an automobile, and I ate sandwiches instead of beefsteaks. And uh, I got a little bit of time, just enough to, I guess, whet the appetite and make me want to really learn to fly, because I wasn't learning to fly. I, I could, yeah, I could mechanically maneuver an airplane, but I didn't call that, in those days, I didn't call that really flying. Where do you go to learn? You either went to the Navy or the Army. I applied to the uh, Army Air Corps, got ex word back real quick to go get a physical exam, all of that at Wright-Patterson. Found myself here at Fort Knox, Kentucky, about less than 90 days later as a sworn in as a, as a flying cadet and went to Randolph. Now from there I'm going to skip and get, we went through some wonderful training. I think I had probably some of the the finest gentleman that I can possibly imagine try to teach me what they knew about flying. And remember this, in those days, we did not have a formal program such. We had a, we had a uh, curricula that had to be followed. You had to learn so much in the ground school, you had to learn so much in the air. But 
your instructor could teach you the manner in which he wanted to teach you. So we were taught in the shadow of them that was flying in the back seat with us. And as I say, I had some excellent instructors. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount from them. When it came time to graduate, I went, called my father in Miami, Florida, and said, come on up to see the graduation. He reluctantly came to San Antonio to see it. After being there for three days, two days prior to the graduation and one day, he got to meet the men that were my instructors, and he got to see some of the things that we're doing. And he reluctantly admitted to me in one of the downtown bistros where we were having a beer, he said, you know, he said, I'll have to take back all of the things that I said. He said, I think that you had the opportunity to learn something from a bunch of men that know what they're doing. I'll skip from that and get into the business of flying airplanes for the military. My first assignment was Fort Benning, Georgia. At Fort Benning, Georgia, I was thrown into an organization that had, when I arrived there with a classmate of mine. There were six pilots. We had 31 enlisted men. We had four airplanes. They were old types. Uh, one of them was, at that particular time, was about 20 years old. The rest of them were closer to the age of, of uh, 15 years. We had 043s, 046s, and BT2s, if you know what those airplanes are. Uh, BT2 was a biplane. The others were monoplanes, high wing. I was given an opportunity at that particular time to fly all I wanted to fly because the men that were there, the other four officers that were pilots, were older than I was and my classmate by the name of Marvin Zip. So we had the opportunity of those airplanes. We could fly anywhere we wanted to, any time that we wanted to, with only one limitation. That limitation initially was we first arrived, I don't know how many of you know Will Tun from Ferry Command, the hump days, and so forth. But anyway, Will Tunner was my operations officer, the first lieutenant. And he took us up to the board, and he had a U.S. map up there, and he took a circle, I mean a string and a pen, and he drew a circle, which was in a 200-mile arc from Fort Benning, Georgia. He said, when you, and my classmate Marvin Zip, he said, when you two have landed in every one of those airfields, I'll let you take your first cross country. So we had our work cut out for us, and we, <laughs> I'm telling you, we landed in fields that hadn't been, had the weeds mowed out of them in, in probably in a year to a year and a half. And uh, if you ever saw anything funny, you ought, to, you ought to see some of that brush down there in Georgia and Florida fly when you set up one of those airplanes in there with that prop turning. But we did, we didn't know any better. Uh, you know, you fly around, you take a look at it, and down you go, with what uh, you just land. Uh, time I got a big surprise. I did that, and the airplane bogged down to almost 30 inches of wood, and there it sat. We had to go dig it out with shovels, and the boss, his name was Robinson, but Will Tunner and Robinson, they gave us a truck. They, my classmate followed me in. They gave us a truck, they gave us shovels, ropes, and everything else. They said, go dig them out. So we spent about three days trying to dig those airplanes out of the mud. Now. With this type of freedom and flying the way I was allowed to fly, I didn't have to fly on anybody's wing. And that was the part, I guess, gripe our classmates from the flying school. They had, they for one year's time, they could never fly an airplane alone. They had to fly on somebody's wing. With this and with the good Lord taking care of us, while well, we managed to acquire probably more experience in a shorter length of time than many people before us and many people after us had that I had the opportunity to do. Three years almost at Fort Benning and I, at that time I was in a position I had a time in different airplanes, even twin engine jobs because we had jo a job of towing targets with uh, E-10s for the Coast Artillery while they would shoot at them. And uh, that is the targets, not us. <laughs> uh, We'd do that for, we'd, all summer long, we'd run those missions, and each one of those missions was 10 hours. So we'd be sitting up there towing the target back and forth on the range for 10 hours at a clip. So it doesn't take you too long to build up time doing that. Uh, with that, the war clouds were gathered because now we're in 1940, and the war clouds are gathering. The 
rules and restrictions that had applied on the people to fly twin engines when I was a second lieutenant out of the flying school. You could not fly a twin engine airplane unless you had five years service as a pilot and at least 1,000 hours. You could not get in a B-17 until you had 15 years of service and you had to have 4,000 flying hours. That was your requirement just to get in the airplanes as a, as a co-pilot. All right, they, they had to lower the requirements. And on the basis of that, I happened to hit the category that had to go to flying A-20s. Now I'll tell you how, again, how crazy we were. Our outfit was, it was the third attack. And they were good. I was a junior birdman in that thing by a long ways when I got assigned to it. It was a Savannah gym. We took those A-20s. We had to test the air raid defenses up and down the United States. Now you tell me if you can think of anybody or you do you know anybody that has ever flown through the streets of New York City, Philadelphia, and Boston below the level of the buildings, and you know what I'll do at Times Square. <laughs> but we did. We were, we went right through those cities because they send us out over the water, we had to come back in it. There were no rules. There was no such thing as an FAA. We had CAA, but they didn't, uh, they didn't do things like the FAA do today. They didn't have it, but this was a necessity to check those things. So we would actually test those systems by down through those cities. Each one of that street, now it sounds silly, but they were all checked out ahead of time, and we were thoroughly briefed on which street we were going to fly down and we did this on the basis of the leader, flight leader, taking us, and he would take the certain either one, each wingman would get the next block over. And uh, we knew how we could go without running into wires and things like that. So it's a lot of fun to go down through those towns. Okay. <laughs> okay. War comes along, and I think Ed's covered it better than I can. We got, we got into B-17s. Prior to getting the 97th out, I don't know if Ed remembers this or not, but in those days, again, we had young people coming out. Well, my gosh, I wasn't an old man then. But anyway, we had younger people come to the flying schools that had little or no experience in any airplane, let alone twin engine or four engine. And I found myself for about 90 days trying to get pilots qualified to fly B-17s for the 97th. I was flying three six-hour training periods a day in B-18s to get enough twin engine time so that we could put them in a four engine. And I got my sleep in the, one of the towers of the hangar, and I fit pretty well, put my fanny down in the opening of a B-17 tire, my, my feet up on one side, and my head went on the other side. You can sleep pretty good that way, especially when you're tired. Uh, they were hectic days, uh, admittedly, but let me tell you, it weren't any harder on me, or it probably as hard on me as were a lot of people. I'm just, I'm just trying to say that it wasn't all easy. Now, I think the next thing to do is to come back to a B-29 real quick. Eddie Allen got killed. I hate to tell you my memory. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in 1943, probably February uh, or early March of 43 when he got killed. And this is when Doolittle tapped me to come back to the States because by his words, General Arnold wanted somebody back there that was a field grade officer that had had ex wartime experience to get on this airplane to see if we could work bugs out of it before it was introduced into combat. Because with the B-17, it was a long ways from bug free. We had a lot of bugs in the B-17s. Cost a lot of lives to start with. We wanted to try to avoid as much of that as we could. So I started flying B-29s. And I think about the first six months that I flew B-29s, without contradiction, I can tell you that I had more twin engine and three engine time in that airplane than anybody's ever lost. <laughs> because that was our problem. We, we, had, we had engine problems. They were underpowered. Uh, the engine was a well-designed engine, but it was not developed. They got awfully hot. Uh, you couldn't get the ignition system. Magnetos and, and the ignition wires wouldn't stand up under the train. So we had a problem with that, and the carburetors wouldn't put fuel in all of the, all of the cylinders. So we worked 
on those things as hard as we could and we alleviated many of them. The armament system was another problem and we worked on that. Finally, we pushed those airplanes out to the CBI theater. Now, after it was done, then because I had a reasonable amount of B-29 experience, I was sent to Grand Island, Nebraska to start a B-29 instructor school. And I, I went down there, but I didn't stay there very long because there's a more important project going on in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and this has a bearing on something to come later. Dr. E.J. Worked at the University of New Mexico, head of the physics department, had a project assigned to him by the United States government to test the vulnerability of the B-29 airplane to fighter aircraft. We had all the U.S. fighters, we had Spitfires, and we had one Jab Zero down there. So we would take that airplane and with other instrumented airplanes, we would do specific fighter curves on the B-29 at different altitudes and so forth so that all of this stuff could be measured and the doctor could uh, come out and, uh, and actually analyze the information had and had there would be some validity to it. I learned something then that served later uh, because one of the one of the test B-29s that we had was in a, incapable of being operated, I don't know, it was grounded for something. We needed to have another airplane, and I just happened to have one there that I used to fly around. And I, I bet I'm the only one you ever saw that had a B-29 four-engine flying machine that could use in the Ministry of Airplane. But that's what I had. I had an airplane that had no armor, it was just a flying machine. And I took that thing, and I went up to make this fighter uh, curves uh, uh, flight and allow that to be done. Inadvertently, because the airplane was so light compared to the other ones, I wasn't paying too much attention. The airplane started, as it lightened up, when the fuel started drifting higher and higher. And I'm not paying any attention to it until they called my attention to the fact that the fighters couldn't touch me. I was about three to 4,000 feet higher than they could operate. Well, that was a mistake at that time because the object was to get data. When I got signed, to, my next assignment went to the, uh, to the bomb project. And when I got into the bomb project, got briefed on what had to happen and so on, got my crews and all that lined up and went out to Wendover, Utah. You all know where Wendover is? It's 125 miles west of Salt Lake City, right up against the Nevada border. Uh, Bob Hope was there with a USO show one time, and he looked around the place. He said, I don't know why the hell they call it Wendover. They ought to call it Leftover. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we, uh, we got out to Wendover, and one of the things that the question in my mind was, when I knew that I had to go over there, I had to fly a single airplane, is the question, how do we, you know, avoid Japanese interception, anti-aircraft and all that? The answer was high altitude. Now, the B-29s that were operating out of the CBI and were starting to operate out of the Marianas were heavily laden with armament. Matter of fact, we carried 7,200 pounds of armament there, counting machine guns, ammunition, armor plate, and all that. It was 7,200 pounds of weight. And I figured, gee, you know, if I could get rid of 7,200 pounds of weight, I can get about 5,000 feet more altitude. And that's what I did. Well, that was the first place that I really got officially accused of being crazy. Kurt LeMay just, he knew that I had lost my mind. You didn't take an airplane into combat unless they had all kinds of guns and armor plate on it. I explained to him what, I, what my rationale was for it, and he said, well, God damn it, excuse the language, but he talked that way. He said, he said you got to live with it, so if you want to do it that way, I can say, nothing I can do about it now, it's too late. And it was. I mean, I had an authority given to me is today, as I look back, it's unbelievable. I could get almost anything that I wanted by asking for it and use a code name for the project, which was Silverplate. One of the things that I wanted one time was I wanted, I had to be operating in a veil of secrecy. I had to be a lone operator. This was all explained to me at the very beginning. I had to operate on my own. I had to do everything on my own. Nobody was going to back me up, particularly the two-star general that gave me the the uh, project because he said, I can't do it. It'll violate secrecy if I do. You have to do everything on your own. It will attract less attention. Good. Now, I needed some transport airplanes to haul things around for the scientists. We had a lot of things that had to be acquired from different locales where they're manufactured because the bomb 
manufacture was spread out all over the United States from Hanford, Washington to Tullahoma, Tennessee. And in between all of that, depending on what it was that had to be manufactured for that thing, it had to be picked up by air, really, and delivered here to Los Alamos or to Wendover. And to do that and get any decent service, I just needed transport airplanes of my own. And I had a fascination for DC-4s, which were brand new at that particular time, so I put in a requisition that I wanted five DC-4s. Nothing happened. Now, in Washington, there was one officer in the air staff besides John Arnold who was acquainted with what I was doing. I was told that if I ever ran into a roadblock and I couldn't overcome it by myself to talk to this officer, and he would give me the right kind of assistance. His name was Ben Wilson. I got put in my requisition and nothing happened on it, and I got, I got nervous about it. I sent in another requisition, and this time I got a call from the allocations office of the Brigadier General in charge of that allocations office. And I got a call from come to him and explain why I wanted those airplanes. So I went to Washington, I went to his office, and he said, why do you want those airplanes? And the only answer I could give him is because I need them. And uh, by this time, he, uh, he was a little bit unhappy with me. And uh, he said, what are you trying to do? Start Tibbetts First Individual Air Force? <laughs> and uh, I said, no, sir. But I said, in the work that I'm doing, I need them. And he said, well, what's your work? And I said, well, that I can't explain to you, but it's, it's important. He said, I don't care how important it is, you can't have it. He said, the Ferry Command needs those airplanes. Yes, sir. And I went out. Well, we went by Wilson's office, told him what my problem was. He said, let me handle it. I wasn't there to see it, but I was told in due course, as a matter of fact, a couple of three days time, if my memory served me right, Wilson called me up and he said, uh, you remember uh, your C-54s? You remember the man that uh, didn't want you to have them? I said, yeah. He said, well, he said, I got called up to General Arnold's office. Wilson. And he said, I understood that the general was coming up there and that we were both to see General Arnold. Fine. And he said, I was called in first because I arrived ahead the head of the general and I was called in first and Arnold was doing something. He said, sit down. He said, I sat down. He said, pretty quick, the general came to the door and he stopped in the doorway and Arnold said to him, said, good morning, major. <laughs> And his staff, Arnold's staff, was there because they followed him in. They knew something was up. And that was all it was said, except that Arnold said now. He said, I said one time in this Pentagon, if an requisition came in with the word silver plate on it, they would get it. He said, I don't care what it is. He said, I'm not going to say it again. Now, that's the kind of thing that we had going at that particular time. Now, believe it or not, I did violate that. I guess you'd call it trust or responsibility because I did order some things one time that were really not needed for the bomb project. I went over to Tinney and made a visit over there and I saw all the fellows that were over there at that particular time they had constructed washing machines using oil drums with wooden paddles for windmills to pump up the, the plunger up and down and to wash so they could wash their clothes and I thought now that my guys deserve better than that, so I put in a requisition for 12 Maytag gasoline motor-driven washing machines. I was two of B-29s, Chicago would pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, we, we did not endure ourselves to those guys on the island when we showed up with our washing machines. But anyway, that's a different story. Now. The other part of the thing, I think you've heard and read all that anybody could talk about as far as, as uh, the flying of the mission is concerned, I still maintain that it was probably one of the best executed missions that ever took place in history of warfare to that time. Air Corps, Air Force, did not break security under any condition, and I was investigated for seven years after that, every time something came up. And uh, one of the, the last incident that caused an investigation to be made was when the Rosenberg were arrested and jailed for giving secrets to the enemy. Before we were ready to load the airplane, I thought that we better do something to attract attention away from that airplane and the loading area and all that. So I had a real good MP outfit 
that belong to me personally and my 509th composite group. Uh, with that MP group, I called in Lou Schaefer, the commander, and I told him, along with one of the ordinance people, I wanted them to take one of the old bomb crates. We had some like-sized objects that we dropped for practice purposes that resembled the final shape of the atomic weapon, but they were just high explosive bombs. And they had to explode on detonation. I mean on impact with the ground. That's where they got detonation. But I had to take one of those crates and set it out there and put a guard on duty. And I said, now instruct your guard to act like he's asleep. And if there's anybody around that's curious, they'll fall for that. I was a student in the War College in 1953 when a pompous lieutenant colonel from the Inspector General's department came in and he wanted to talk to me. So they excused me from class or from seminar and I went to talk to this man. He showed me all of his credentials and so forth and he says, now, I want you to explain this picture. And there was a picture of my guard sleeping in front of this box. And I started laughing. I said, well, it took a little while to get here, but here it is, what are you talking about? So I told him what I've told you. He made him so damn mad he <laughs> folded up everything he had and he, he went out and left. I said, you know, they fell for it. That, was, that ended all the investigations. But I'm so proud of that group because they could fly airplanes, they could navigate, they could bomb, they could do all the things, and they could raise more hell than anybody, any group of people you could imagine, because they, they had to let off steam. I mean, we were isolated from the rest of the world. And I was uh, reciting earlier here this evening that when I understand that General Lee Wade talked to this group of people, I met Lee at Batista Field in Havana, Cuba, because I wanted to get my guys some training flying over water coming in off of water to a land contrast and dropping bombs on a land range. That's a little bit different than flying over land all the time and doing it. I wanted to get that training. Besides, I wanted them to celestial navigate and not to use uh, any of the so-called navigation means that we had in those days, electronic as they were, I didn't want them to use that. They had to be celestial navigators or, or they had to navigate by the sun or the other. Those were the two requirements, and we were pretty stiff on that. Uh, two of the crews were off on a weekend. They went down into Havana to have a good time. They got themselves rooms and tell. I don't know what else they did. I didn't ask them. But anyway, uh, Next time I was down there, Lee Wade called me and he said, you've got a couple of real, you know, ambition, I would say rather uh, strong type crews there. And I said, I said, what do you mean, General? Or who's Colonel? I said, what do you mean, Colonel? He said, well, he said, uh, all of this little incident occurred. He said, these guys were down there. And he said, I saw the competitiveness of the crews just from one day to another, watching them drop bombs and checking results and betting money on who could drop the bomb the closest, who could navigate the best, and all that sort of thing. He said, I saw all that going on. I thought it was great spirit. But he said, they carried it a little too far because he said they got downtown the hotel. And apparently, after they had a few drinks, the competitors came out again, so they took the fire hoses down from the wall. They started using the fire hoses with a, with a water battle. And he said the uh, people down there really, the Cubans didn't take too kindly to that. And he said, I got called in on it. And the story, he said, I told the fellas that I wouldn't carry it any further if they'd pay for the damage because the hotel people would be happy if that happened. So he said, I collect the money, we paid it and so forth. But he said, we got a little procedure now. He said, I talked to all the crews, dump they're going to have a water fight, come on up to the barracks. They can have one of the barracks, do all the fighting they want. And uh, I, I thought that that might illustrate, as I say, the, the type of people that they were. They were, they were so good. I uh, don't know what else, to, what else I can say for them. I've opened up Pandora's box. Uh, we can talk about anything that you, that you want to talk about. I'll try to give you the best explanation I got. If I don't have one, I'll, I'll tell you that. So who wants to try me first? I got one deficiency, and that is uh, nobody told me years ago that prop propeller tip noise would hurt your hearing. And when we first got around jet airplanes, I didn't know that you couldn't stand in front of one of them with engines running and, you know, do something. But uh, I know now that that's not the proper thing to do. So I do, <laughs> she'll verify, I do have a hearing problem. But uh, if you'll shout at me, I'm sure that we can, we can make out all right. I don't know how to begin, please. Uh, isn't it right that your plane was named for your mother and uh, also is she from Pennsylvania? 
All right. The airplane was named for my mother, and uh, her family were Pennsylvania Dutch and went out to Iowa in uh, covered wagons. Uh, don't ask me when, but my grandma at that time was three years old, my mother's mother. The idea there was, in those days, wartime days, people had all the names on airplanes. Some of them were in honor of cities, in honor of girlfriends, uh, I don't know, anything that you wanted. I wanted that airplane to be named something that I felt would not be duplicated anywhere that they could think of. Well, my mother's name was Estrangement in those days, and I felt that that was a pretty safe bet that there would be no other airplane named Enola Gay. Also, she, she took my side when I wanted to go fly against the old man. <laughs> She, she just made it. Under the old man and everything, but boy, when he was hot about this when I finally told him I was already a flying cadet. <laughs> she, we were sitting at the, the luncheon table, and uh, he was hot under the collar. And she looked at me, and she said, she, let, she, always, she didn't give him too much mind. I mean, she never excited about very many things, and hardly ever cracked a smile, except the corner of her mouth would wrinkle a little bit. But she looked at me. And she, she said, Paul, if you want to go fly an airplane, you'll be all right. Well, I can remember a lot of occasions. I said, well, <laughs> Mom said I'd be all right, so. <laughs> <laughs> Who will throw another one? You'll notice there's a Baby Ruth candy bar oh. in place. Tell us about the read, please. I explained earlier that my father did not want me to get in an airplane. Let's go back to my tender age of, I don't know, six years old or five years old, I was visiting with my mother up in her hometown in Iowa, a little place called Gooden, Carroll County, 90 miles northeast of Des Moines, Iowa, seven miles from the county, east of the county seat called Carroll. In those days, uh, carnivals, circuses, and everything advertised their arrival by having a barnstormer with them. The barnstormer would go around all the little country towns. This town had 928 people in it. Uh, that's what the outside sign said when you drove in, Glidden population 928. Uh, this airplane came over Glidden and started buzzing the place and doing Immelmans and loops and all that kind of stuff. I didn't know what they were in those days, but anyway, boy, I'm standing there watching that airplane. My uncles all got, came out of the field where they're plowing, they put the horses in the barn, and everybody got in Model T's, and we went the direction that that airplane would fly and go west, and they'd come back and then go west again, meaning go west, young man, and that's where the carnival is. And sure enough, just on the outskirts of Carroll, there was a large field there and they were setting the business there and this barnstormer was taking people for a ride for a dollar and I wanted to go for a ride in that airplane. My mother and my uncles wouldn't let me do it despite all the tears and everything else. They said no your father doesn't want you to ride in an airplane and my mother said I'm not going to take the responsibility of you getting killed and uh, so that was a story. Now at the tender age of 13 years old, my father was in the wholesale confectionery business in Miami, Florida. He was the, the distributor for the state of Florida for Curtis Candies. They sent Doug Davis, racing pilot from Cleveland, they sent Doug Davis down there with his buying, and his job was to drop Baby Ruth candy bars, which about the size of in those days, the nickel candy bar was about the size of three of these things, or even bigger. They were definitely a candy bar. <laughs> he had acquired in some way paper pursuits that came packaged in one box and the baby roots in the big crates and in the, uh, cardboard cartons. In my dad's shop, his, some of the, his employees, Doug Davis, I did, and everybody, we were taught how to attach these paper parachutes to the candy bar so that, and wrap the chute around it so when you dropped it out, the slipstream would open it up and they'd come floating down. Well, Dave said when he got all of the stuff packed up for the next day's journey out over the racetracks in the Miami Beach also, he said, I got to have somebody go with me to throw these things, help throw these things out. 
And I volunteered like that. My old man looked at me and he said, not you. Well, anyway, make a long story short, Doug came to my rescue and he talked to my dad for a look. And he said, I don't know, he went through his credentials and he said, I've been flying these airplanes, I'm married, I got children. And he said, I'm not going to do anything to kill myself, let alone kill him. And so finally, the old, and a couple of the employees that worked my dad, they were friendly toward me, and they, they pushed him a little bit, and he said, okay, okay. He said, you, I'll let you go. So you can do it once. Well, I did it a little bit more than once after the first trip, but that was, <laughs> that was uh, my introduction uh, to an airplane for the first time, and obviously, needless to say, it was a thrill. Uh, the first ride that Doug gave me was straight, take off normal, climb on out, get over the racetrack, throttle back, and circle. Boy, we throw these chutes out of the whole place, just feel full, of course, running out of the grandstand. They were dropping on the racetrack and had to be picked up because they're afraid of scaring the horses, I presume. I mean, and obviously, you don't leave debris on a racetrack, but people want to eat the candy, too. We went to Miami Beach and did the same thing. That worked out so well, I got to go again. Uh, the next time, well, Doug said, uh, he got up there, we are riding along, we dumped all the candy. He said, uh, do you ever do a loop? And I said, no. He said, well, I'll show you how it works. So he pushed down and opened the throttle up and did a, what I call a beautiful loop in those days. Of course, that's my first experience. And that helped, too. That, uh, you know, that kind of convinced me that this is something different. And uh, so that is the thing that confirmed my conviction that someday I had to fly an airplane. Any other? <coughs> at at uh, one point before the, the mission, did you tell the crew, you know, what the actual mission was to be? And what was the reaction to this explanation? <coughs> I can't answer the question exactly like you have answered, but let me tell you the introduction that I gave the crew. The first thing that I said to them after being assigned the job in September of 44 was that we were going to do something that was special. It was going to be different from the ordinary uh, things that we had been doing with B-17s. It was going to be a bombing type mission with a weapon different than we had before. Fine. I asked them at that time. Now these are guys that I knew real well. I asked him at that time, I said, don't ask me to tell you more than I volunteered to tell you. I'll tell you what you need to know, because this is what they told me. We'll tell you anything you need to know to do the job correctly. But you're better off not knowing too much. And on the basis of that, none of them gave me any, any kind of a problem at all. On the night before we went out on the mission, the bomb had been exploded at Almagorda, and the one that was on the tower, it had been exploded. They had photographs of it. Now, they were sending some observers that had been there, had seen it, along with the pictures. They sent them out to Tinian, and they were there the night that we were, the next, excuse me, the next night, that was the night we were going to take off. So, fine. I still didn't use the word bomb when I showed them the pictures and said, we're going to do this. The tactics that we were using were different than anybody. Why, how do you, why do you fly one single airplane at that altitude? And then after you release the bombs, why do you put it up basically on one wing, which we did was almost a 60 degree bank, pulling that thing around as fast as we could. And that, for some of you pilots, uh, that's an interesting procedure because we tried that for the first time in the question. We had to turn that airplane almost 180 degrees within 50 seconds. That was the name of the game. So how do you take an airplane at 30,000 feet of that size and weight and turn it? Well, you just keep cranking in more and more and getting the steeper and steeper till finally I was able to do it by just keeping a chatter in the tail, just keeping the tail stalling a little bit. And we worked it out. So we get 180, but really the scientist and the mathematician said that you have to turn 157 degrees. That's the number of degrees you must turn because the bomb will fall, it will explode, the shock wave will come back up on an ever-expanding circle. The way you get the greatest distance between yourself and an, an expanding circle is to get tangent to it. So 157 degrees is tangent. 
I didn't have it. I couldn't do that because I didn't have 157 degrees where I could read it on my gyro compass, but I had a six there, and I could I could read 160. So that's what we we practice on doing it that way. Now, on the way to the target, we had to arm the bomb. The we, the atmosphere as such was out of those islands at that time of the year that they had a cloud deck that ran between seven and nine thousand feet constantly. Nine would be up and seven would be at the bottom of it. Broken clouds, scattered clouds, but it was a little bit turbulent. We had to have the smoothest air we could get so those guys could stand back Bombay and insert the critical material into the weapon at that particular time, which was about a, oh, roughly a 30 minute job. We took off. We climbed up. We did. We got the thing going. It all checked out. Everything was fine. They came back out of the Bombay. We pressurized the airplane and went merrily on our way. Now, when that was done, all of us had been up in excess of, of 30 hours. I personally, I, I, as far as I can remember, been, I'd been about 40 hours before without any sleep at that particular point. And we I went back in the back of the airplane because crawled through the tunnel, went back, talked to the fellas in the back, got them in there, there were four of them back there, and I said, okay, now I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. My tail gunner by the name of Bob Karen was pretty smart. Uh, we're sitting on parachutes and whatnot back there. He looked at me, he said, Colonel, we're not playing with Adams, are we? And I said, yeah, that's what we're doing. He said, I thought so. The fellas up in the front, the bombardier and the nav light engineer, co-pilot, we'd been working so close with it, it really wasn't necessary to tell anything. By that time, they already knew, but it, the words weren't used, and nobody asked, but that's, that is the time at which I said we are carrying an atomic weapon. I'll bring out one other thing that a lot of people don't know. I've been at Maxwell Field, and I've, they got German students down, got Japanese students, and a few other things. I've talked similar to the way I'm talking now about the mission as such. My original directive was to train and prepare to use those weapons simultaneously in Europe and in Japan. That's the reason I was independent. That's the reason I had transport airplanes. Part of the reason uh, I had to be I had to be a cohesive unit, and I had to have the capability for a split operation. So that's uh, we had 14, a little over 1,400 men. I had. I had 15 B-29s and I had five secret force. I had an ordnance squadron, I had an MP squadron, I had everything that normally you wouldn't have except the wing level. Had some interesting people in my ordnance squadron, I tell this, I don't know if you've read it, but the secrecy can be kept if it's necessary. In that, or, in that organization that I had, and three of them were in, I had I had two convicted murderers that had escaped from the pen, and I had three convicted felons that had escaped from the pen. This is how good the security guys were that worked on the Manhattan Project. The U.S. Army, the U.S. government, the FBI, and all of that sort of stuff hadn't picked these guys up. But these people had skills that you couldn't find. They were tool and die makers of the highest caliber. And I needed them. I needed those people badly in that outfit. And when I got the dossiers from the security people, they said, what do you want to do? I said, as long as those guys are doing what they're doing now, I want to keep fine. I called them in, one at a time. I showed them, I called them by their right name. I showed them the dossier. And I said, now look at go back to your organization and you're going to be so-and-so as far as I'm concerned, sergeant so-and-so, corporal this or whatever, and when this war is over, you come to me and I will give you this dossier and I will give you the matches to burn it up. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Today, if my life depended on I couldn't tell you their names. I didn't want to know their names. Didn't want to remember it. But anyway, that's way ahead. Yeah, we've missed uh, this side of the house. Yeah. Did you ever actually pick a target in Europe? And if so, what were the targets? Yeah. Pick a target in Europe? Did you ever pick one? No, no, we did not pick a target in. We did not pick a target in Europe for the very reason that targeting as such was not considered until the end of April of 1945. That's when we did that. Now. 
Does that, that brings up a question I'll volunteer uh, an answer to the question. What targets were picked and why did you pick them uh, in Japan? Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Niigata, and Kuko were the four targets that were picked. They were picked because they had not been bombed by the 20th Air Force. They all were, believe it or not, despite what you read, they all were military type targets. They all had some military significance. Hiroshima was the southern command headquarters for the in armies that were being assembled to defend against invasion. I don't remember what the rest of them were, but anyway, that's the case there. Uh, those targets were picked at that particular time. The 20th Air Force General Native people were told under no circumstances would they bomb the targets. That was done by General Arnold because scientists, the scientific element, wanted as virgin information as they could get as to the damage that would be caused to different kinds of structures, different types of things that existed on the surface of the Earth at that time. And we went in, right? Right after the thing was over with, we beat, we beat the occupation forces into Hiroshima and Nagasaki both. Because, and we took people in there and let them out, and they stayed there for weeks, made scientific observations and data and so forth. I went into Nagasaki and uh, wandered all over that place just, just like an ordinary tourist, uh, buying souvenirs. They were very famous for wood carvings in that place. They had, they were good on rice bowls and trays. Unfortunately, the tray in that the wood, when it dried out, it cracked. I never did keep it there. I still got some rice bowls in that day. Now, did I understand you say that only one bomb had been exploded before? Had only one bomb been exploded in experiment before you dropped you. That's true. The one that was sitting on the tower at Almagorda. Now, that was the Nagasaki-type bomb. There was a difference between the Hiroshima bomb, and if here, there's a difference between the Hiroshima bomb and the Nagasaki bomb. The Hiroshima bomb was almost 100% sure as far as an explosion was concerned. Because what they're doing there, they were taking and bombarding a piece of pure uranium on one end into a piece of pure uranium on the other through a, actually a gun barrel. That's what they had in the center of that bomb. And they drove it with a charge of powder. And when you drive those two together at a certain velocity, they knew they would get a critical situation and there would be an atomic explosion. The Nagasaki bomb was of a different type of construction. It was called an implosion bomb. And what they had there was U-235, not pure uranium. They had U-235. And they had a ball in there, probably about the size of a softball, is as close as I could come. There were 36, it was a spherical shape, there were 36 blocks horpex around that. And they were so well fitted, and it had to be so well fitted, I promise you, you couldn't get a cigarette paper to go between the blocks. There's no way. That's how close and how tight that the tolerance had to be. The explosion took place with champion, not selling champion, champion spark plugs. In each one of those blocks of torx, there was a spark plug there that was ignited by a barometric release, putting the batteries to throw in the current into each one of those spark plugs simultaneously so that they could crush that center ball of U-235 and that caused the explosion to take place at that time. My next question was going to be, were you pretty certain that uh, were you pretty certain you would have an explosion with the first one and the second? Yeah, I, I, I felt I felt confident. I, I did. There's there's one other thing that took place at this particular time. The scientists wanted perfection. They wanted to experiment and experiment and experiment. I was sitting and went over at Utah in April with an outfit that was well trained and ready to go, and I felt somewhat like a football coach. You know, you can overtrain if you don't look out. And on the basis of that, I ordered my outfit overseas. That's the only time I ever got in trouble with Leslie Gross, and it came out all right because he was under he understood what was going on. I did order my outfit overseas. I should have checked with him before I did it, but I felt like just wasting time. I had to get them overseas because I could urge the people on. I did this after talking with Dr. Oppenheim, and I said to Oppenheim. I said, what are we waiting for? What do we? He said, we want to be sure this weapon will explode. In other words, this barometric explosion mechanism will work properly. 
And I said, well, okay, fine. I, I think that, you know, that's admirable, but what are the probabilities now of a failure? He said, one in 10,000. I, I said, what are you looking for? He said, one in a million. I said to myself, I'll take one in 10,000 odds any day of the week. What do you think of the later uh, investigation of Dr. Oppenheimer? What do you think of the later investigation of Dr. Oppenheimer? I think Oppenheimer was unjust crucified. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> Opp Oppenheimer, listen, this is a man that you had to see to believe, and then when you saw him, you wouldn't. I never saw a brain like that. He lived in a world of all of his own. He never failed to admit when he was a college student this idea of communism was great and so forth. It was a thing to do, and he joined the Communist Party and so forth. He never participated. They never proved that he participated in it because he didn't. But I can see his point of view. The type of brain that he is, I will illustrate by one story. And that is, at Los Alamos, Los Alamos had been built originally as a hospital. And the way that Army military hospitals wartime were constructed in that time, you had a long corridor, and off of that corridor you had all kinds of bays. Between the bays you had offices for doctors and nurses or whatever. And this is what they were occupying, the scientific element were occupying this kind of a facility. I went there one day on business, which I had to do frequently, and I was met at the entrance to this uh, hospital facility, office complex that they had by Dr. Oppenheim. And a man was a Navy captain that was assigned uh, Deke Parsons. The two of them met me. We started walking down the corridor. We were talking, Parsons and I were talking, because he and I talked back and forth frequently uh, on these types of problems. As a matter of fact, if you got any further than that with Parsons or myself, you had to get, we had to get another physicist, Dr. Norman Ramsey, because Ramsey had the unique ability to talk to the scientists in the terms that they understood, but he could also translate it into layman's language so we could understand. Okay, we're walking down there, we're doing some talking. We passed the doorway, I don't know, we might have taken three steps or four steps, and Oppenheim is on the door side or the wall side over there, he's on that side. He stops without saying anything, turns around and goes back. Parsons and I stop and follow him back, and he walks in this office, in this door to this room. The room, I'm guessing, I don't know, room might have been 25, 30, 30 feet square, something like that. These three walls were covered with backboard. A straight back chair in the middle. A man is sitting in that straight back chair. All over these three boards are nothing but formulas. And I don't know, don't ask me what type. They might have been chemical, they might have been physical formulas, but anyway, they, I recognize formulas. Oppenheim stands there for a minute behind this man. He walks up to the board in front of him and down in the left-hand corner he rubs something out, puts something else in there, and the man in the chair jumps up and claps his hands. He says, I've been looking for that mistake for three days. That was Enrico Fermi. Oppenheim saw it walking by the door. How do you, how do you explain it? On your crew, Stanley Gay, how many members and are, are, are still How many crew are they still living and do you see each other? There were 13 aboard that airplane. One of those 13 was this man Parsons that I mentioned. Parsons was the first to die. He, after the war, he got a, a, a destroyer division out in the in the Mediterranean. He did, he died on board a destroyer of attack. Uh, the next man to go was uh, one of my people. Uh, by the name of uh, Joe Staborik. Joe Staborik was a radar operator. Uh, Joe died. My co-pilot just recently died, about a year ago. Bob Lewis died, a heart attack. All of those are heart attacks. My flight engineer, Wyatt Dusenberry, died again. Uh, Wyatt didn't die of a heart attack. He drank himself to death, unfortunately. Now, the bombardier, the navigator, myself, the radio operator, the tail gunner, and one of the mechanics, and forgive me, I can't think of his name, uh, the assistant flight engineer, he, they are alive. The answer is, 
we've never made it a project to see each other or do anything like that. We keep in touch by telephone note or something of that type. Uh, we had a reunion last year in Philadelphia. I went to Philadelphia, but I was the only one that made it from my crew. Uh, two of the guys, Ed remember Tom Farabee, the bombardier, and Van Kirk, the navigator, we were in the 97th together and a little over, I guess it was two years ago now, we had a reunion in St. Louis, and both of those guys were there at the same time. Farabee's retired, and he stayed in the military, retired as a colonel, he lives in Orlando, Florida. Van Kirk came from a uh, family of chemists. He went through and became a chemist. Uh, he is now head of uh, DuPont's something the uh, division that DuPont has out in, in, uh, on the West Coast. Uh, he's the uh, vice president for marketing for them out there on the coast. Uh, that's about the most I can tell you about the crew. Yes? Uh, for those, those of you who did the uh the uh, bomb site at Hiroshima. When you went to uh, Hiroshima, yeah, yeah. saw any effects of radiation? Did any of those people have yeah. effects of radiation themselves? Uh, effect of radiation. Uh, again, I am not what you call a qualified person to discuss that, but there were no effects from radiation that anybody is aware of. Uh, one of the things that has been said that, uh, you know, if uh, you wouldn't be able to have children and that sort of thing, well, my bombardier, who was probably closer to it than anybody else, he had four children after the war. Uh, the airplane did get some radiation. They had Geiger counters on it when we got back. But one of the things that are not too well understood is that at the distance that we were from those weapons at that particular time, the radiation was not as severe as it was on the surface of the Earth, obviously. Uh, the next thing is radiation, uh, as I understand it and as I saw it, water does a whole lot. We, were, we flew through rain going back, the airplane got washed a little bit. When we went to Nagasaki, of course it was raining, I won't say constantly, but it was a lot of rain in Japan. It could rain there just as easy as could be. And as we walked around it in nothing but shorts, shoes, and shirts, uh, not even thinking. Nobody even mentioned radiation to us. And we wandered around that place for two days. So the after it at the Bikini Project, the same thing happened. Uh, we were exposed to it to some degree, but it had, it had no effect on us that we know of. Nothing's ever shown up I'm aware of. Anything that you remember about uh, the crew that went on the second raid and uh, that mission, anything outstanding or significant that you remember about that? Uh, the second mission uh, flown by uh, uh, airplane commander by the name of Charles Sweeney. Sweeney had been with me on the testing of the B-29s. Uh, the bombardier, Kermit Behan, had been with us in the 97th Bomb Group over in England. Those were the first people that I requested by name when I got this project assignment because I knew, first off, we had to fly an airplane and fly well. The second thing I knew was we had to bomb well, we had to navigate well. And I knew that those people could do those things and I, I brought them into that. Now, uh, when it came time to select the crews to go, the question has been raised and some people have said that they didn't know why I did it or other people have said they should have done it instead of me and so forth. Um, I, of course, would disagree with this. I was given the assignment. I had the full responsibility. The next thing is I was not prone to let anybody make a mistake for me. And had that taken place, I'm sure that those people that have since said they were supposed to do it would not have accepted the blame for it. Uh, so responsibility of command is something that you have to be in that position to understand what it means. And I felt that it was my responsibility to, to try it for the first time. I told Sweeney, follow me. In. I had him follow me in on that mission. I said, if I make a mistake, and we talked on the radio constantly on the, on the bomb run. I said, if I make a mistake, I don't want you to make the same one that I did. Sweeney had never been shot at. Uh, I didn't know if we were going to be shot at or not. I didn't think we would be. But on the other hand, I knew Kermit Behan had been shot at. He'd been shot at, shot up, and a few other things in Europe. And I knew that there was a cool customer. 
and I had an agreement with Sweeney that he would do exactly what Kermit Behan told him to do. He said, if Kermit tells me to fly the airplane upside down, he said, I'll try it. I said, that's, that's fair enough for me. And when they went in, they did run into some trouble because they had a malfunctioning a valve on a, on a Bombay fuel tank, and they were running short on fuel, and they ran into bad weather because, again, they waited too long to try to get another airplane to rendezvous with them at Iwo Jima. And that was part of the procedure, was to pick up the escort airplanes, one on each wing to carry instruments, and out of Tinian to go to Iwo Jima over Suribachi at the 360 and take out for the, for the uh, shoreline of Japan. And by that time, everybody should have been in formation. Well, the second airplane didn't get in formation as fast as he should have, so Sweeney lost about 20 minutes uh, on that deal. Uh, 20 minutes was critical enough that they had a problem of releasing the bomb visually at the aiming point they were directed to do. I can tell it now because B hand, they didn't have enough fuel to carry that bomb back, and they would have had a problem defusing it if they had tried to take it back. So on the basis of that, Behan, when they made a second circle over Nagasaki, he told Sweeney, I got the airplane. That means he clutched in the bomb site to the autopilot, he took it over, and he dropped it off about a thousand yards from the initial aim point, but he recognized the place there that was a, a positive identification and, based on what we knew that time, the thousand foot error at that point wouldn't have made that much difference and it didn't. But I, I think all in all, the mission was really well done under the circumstances. What shockwave did you experience as you left the target? When we made the turn, after the bomb left the airplane, approximately 10,000 pounds released. This time the airplane nose wants to go up. I'm pulling it under my side as fast as I can to make my turn. 51 seconds later, I'm out of it, and I just roll out as the thing explodes and the shock wave comes up. My tail gunner sees it coming. It didn't, at 51 seconds, it wasn't up there. We had to wait up for three seconds for it to get up there and hit us. Accelerometer in the airplane showed two and a half Gs. We got three, we got three bumps out of it. The first one was two and a half. I don't know what the second one was, but it was half of that. And the third one, we had to kind of wait and anticipate it hitting the airplane. Yes. The most difficult mission was over Europe. Yeah, uh, the, the subject is uh, your missions over Europe, and talk about the situation in the Mediterranean European theater during the early days. Are you all bearing with me? It's most difficult. We're doing great. Now, you, <laughs> the most difficult. The most difficult doing. Your most difficult mission. Your most difficult mission also. Well, in a, in a sense of the word, let me put it this way: the most difficult was the first one. <laughs> now we encountered the least opposition, but it was it was the most difficult because I always tell everybody it was a pure case of the blind leading the blind. There was, uh, we didn't know anything. We had really been, I, I guess the best word to say, we had been frightened. We had been scared by the RAF. The RAF kept telling us, and this was a part of the politics of the business, the RAF wanted the U.S. to augment their effort, and they were night bombers, and we were daylight high altitude bombers. They had tried daylight, they tried high altitude, and they had lost their shirt. They lost everything that they threw out there, and they said, you cannot exist. And they sent all kinds of people up to Polbrook, where we were to talk to us and tell us about how quickly we were going to get shot down by doing what we were doing. Well, for mission out, uh, we were apprehensive because we didn't know except what the British had told us. The mission took off, we assembled reasonably well, we got our fighter escort and we crossed the channel and we got on the other side. We we're riding along without much to do at that particular point when we start seeing black puffs up around us. Well, everybody looked, and I'm not trying to be facetious, we didn't understand what artillery, you know, aircraft artillery was until it got closer to us. And then we could smell the cordite and we knew that somebody was angry. They were shooting at us. Uh, we, had, we had a couple airplanes get hit 
Uh, the fighters came up. Uh, we had the RAF there trying to scare them off. But then the fight, you know, it's the air battle started, not aggressively as they became later, because the Germans were trying to feel us out. That was their method of doing things. They didn't want to come barging in. They wanted to kind of pick here, pick there, and see. They realized that the B-17 was more heavily armed than any airplane that the British had that they'd been up against at this point. We flew a tight formation, which gave three times the number of guns that they had to face from anything that they'd ever faced before, and they were cautious on that. Uh, we, we went, we bombed our target, and missed the hell out of it, but turned around and got back home, and, you know, we thought we were doing real great. I think the roughest mission that we ever had was when we went to bomb the submarine pens of St. Nazaire, because uh, they, were, they were tough. They had those submarine pens protected real well by fighters and by uh, anti-aircraft. And believe it, it's real, it just makes a fellow feel real bad to watch 1,100 pounders, armor-piercing bombs, go down and hit and come back up the air and explode. That's what they were doing. Those sub pens were tough. I went to France, I don't know, five or six years ago down there uh, to the uh, uh, Dassault, uh, no, Espacial manufacturers to look at a business jet airplane that they were building, and the, the men at that factory took us in to look at those sub pens. And man, when you get inside of it, you could see they had, they had concrete in some places that was over reinforced concrete that was 20 feet thick. So that was, that was the worst. We got, we got beat up pretty bad. We lost airplanes right and left. We had a lot of people wounded, badly killed, and so forth. It, uh, I got one, if, I'll, no, I'll digress just a minute to get, to get off of this subject. It's a little bit gory, but today, God bless them, they've got a lot of women in the Air Force, and every time I go to Maxwell, they always ask one question. Do you believe in a woman going into combat? And I say, no, I really, I'll tell you why I don't because I was raised to respect women, to think that she was a little bit different and so forth and so on. And I said, I saw too many men laying on floors of bombers with their guts hanging out and bleeding all over the place. I don't think I'd like to look at a woman that way. I didn't get any more questions. I heard that we only had three atomic devices, <coughs> three that we used to, the two were not the one that was tested. Is that true? We had, when we bombed Nagasaki, we had, I mean, when we bombed Hiroshima, we had two other weapons that were ready for use. The one that was on the island, ready to go, and was used at Nagasaki. There was another one that went over, and I had a bomber airplane sitting out there with that thing sitting inside of it for a crew to fly it over to us if we needed it. Now, there were other parts and pieces, but there were no assembled bombs other than that. We would have been about seven or eight days getting another assembled weapon. But we had the capability to keep on. We had a capability, but it was not what you would call a reliable capability as far as being able to depend upon X number of weapons at certain intervals. No. Why, why was the first one brought over on Indianapolis rather than Plum? The first one, the uranium, pure uranium material was so expensive and was needed so badly to make that weapon work that they couldn't afford to risk it all in one place. They flew half of the material over in a transport airplane, the other with two guys carrying it. The other half was on the Indianapolis. The Nagasaki weapon, the U-235, was not as expensive as pure uranium. Expensive to manufacture or dollar cost was not nearly as expensive. And they could replace that if they lost it, so they just started it right out in the transport airplane. One of my transport went and got it down at, Lo at Los Alamos, and and uh, brought it right on out to the island. General Tibbetts, I understand from some of the things that I've read, was there a little bit of a conflict prior to the Hiroshima <coughs> mission as to who was going to be in the left seat of your airplane? Well, you might have heard that, but as I said, you're, you're talking to the guy that will assure you there was no conflict. I was a commander. I was. <laughs> I, I was under that outfit. I was going to fly that airplane. I, another thing, there was there there was no other pilot in that outfit that had ever been shot at. I had been. I knew what I'd do if they started shooting at me, but I didn't know what anybody else would do. 
I had more time by three times the number of hours of anybody else to be 29, so I felt that I was qualified to do it. Especially since I devised the tactics and did all of the test work and so forth. I dropped, I dropped 14 of those things before I ever went over to Tinian. I dropped them out, they were inert, but I dropped them on the salt flat. First off, to find out if they'd go where we wanted them to go, we had trouble initially doing that. Some of the other crews dropped some of those that if we pointed down this way, it ended up over here. Because, I mean, it was, you couldn't guide them very well. We had to really work on that thing and get our ballistics down to where we could rely on them. And I'd like say about the last 14 of those things, I did that myself. And I was, that's why I was convinced we were ready to go. We had, we had dummy powder charges in them. We could photograph the explosion. They were set to, they were set to ignite at 4, 1,500 feet above the surface of the earth. As they came down, that's where they were set to, to explode. And we photographed to find out, well, they exploded at 12 feet, uh, 1,200 feet, 1,000 feet, 1,500 feet, which really was negligible as far as air is concerned. On the right, here's a question. Did you encounter any fighter aircraft? No. Aircraft? No, we encountered no difficulty, and I attribute this to, to two things. First off, the Japanese at that particular time were trying to conserve everything that they could. They didn't want to burn any fuel. They didn't want to take a chance on losing any airplanes because they were counting on invasion. Number two, for over a week before we went up there, I sent single airplanes up there with these practice bombs in them to fly around and drop bombs on places that had already been bombed because oil refineries, steel mills and something, there was always a building of some kind of city uh, there as an aiming point, and we sent the crews up to do that. I wanted the people to do two things. First off, I wanted to think a, a single airplane was going to really cause them any great uh, problem. I also sent airplanes up to do weather checking, and I want to think as reconnaissance. And actually, we're told now, Japanese history or people that have investigated, they did believe it was reported when they saw us coming or heard us coming that we were just more reconnaissance airplanes. Don't pay attention to them. Yes, here. Two questions. Uh, did you have any fire protection or any fighters on the... Uh, no, no, no. We had no protection. Uh, we didn't have a fighter in those days that could fly the distance that we could fly with the B-29 so they couldn't escort us. And the second thing is, we didn't want any fighters up there in that area because of not knowing exactly what the effect of the bomb would be and that sort of thing. I mean, it, I, somebody had said one time, I talked to some fighter pilots that said, well, they had P-38s on Okinawa and they could have sent them up there. Probably they could, but uh, we, we, we didn't want them. I was convinced in my mind that that extra <laughs> bit of altitude would take real good care of me. Uh, what did you consider more of a threat on conventional bomb on the uh, anti-aircraft? Fighters. Which was a more conventional threat on the bomb run, any aircraft or fighters? It would it would have been anti-aircraft if there had been any anti-aircraft in the Japanese hands that would shoot that high with accuracy. But we all we knew from past experience that they didn't have nearly the accuracy of radar-controlled guns that the Germans had. They did their their weapons were supposed to be accurate only to 22,000 feet. Now, after that, they're less than accurate, but they're dangerous. I felt that 33,000 feet was just that much more insurance, and that's where we bombed, to 33,000. The Germans were mighty good, weren't they? He said the Germans were good, were they not? <laughs> I guarantee you they were good. Yeah, the Germans were very good. They were very accurate. But, uh, Partner? Oh, could you tell us a little bit about the bikini experiment? The bikini project? Okay. The bikini project was conducted for two, two basic purposes. Number one was really to find out what would the weapon do against the material that we had available to us in a war theater. That included battleships cruisers and all of that sort of thing. That was one question. But behind the whole thing was a fight between the Air Force and the Navy. The Navy had always been the strategic arm of the United States, and this is a strategic weapon, and they wanted the weapon. The Air Force said, 
we are the strategic arm of the United States because we can not only go fly over the water, we can fly over the land and make the delivery. We have the equipment to do it, we have the training, we have no soil. Okay, so it's a big argument. And so therefore, the thing got down to a decision, political decision, we will test the weapon, we will find out who in reality should have that as their uh, main striking arm. All right. The decision was made. I was in on the planning for it. The Navy, when they first got the uh, uh, lagoon out there, Bikini, they wanted to put all the ships basically in a straight line, one behind the other, and that sort of thing. And I advocated that if we do that, of course, that will help us to have a larger bombing area than about anything I could think of. Now, if we would use those vessels and put them in a shape that would re represent a target that you shoot at with rifles, it has a fly in the center, and then it has rings around it, you know, the ten ring and uh, I mean, the, whatever they are, I don't, I'm not a rifleman, but anyway, different distances out in circumference or diameter across the circle would be a line of ships so that if you miss the bullseye you're still going to get a recordable type of a damage. The first problem that came up was the Navy said well we can't the vessels in that kind of a position there's no way to do it but somehow or other somebody convinced them it could be done and they did. They made the, all of those vessels and everything out there were put in circles with the bullseye, I forget which, I think it was the Missouri, wasn't it? No, not the Missouri, it was the, uh, one of the battleships was the... Nevada, okay. was it? Nevada, okay. That was, the, that was the center of the thing. And on the basis of that, uh, the, uh, the bikini tests were conducted. They were very, actually they were, they were very informative, those tests. We learned an awful lot from them. And uh, unfortunately, the, uh, we didn't get to sink that battleship the way we thought we were going to. That was, again, another political decision that was made uh, at uh, the Air Force uh, part of it. And uh, when that happened, uh, Behan was the man that tried to bombardier on that airplane to listen to it because he knew what he was, data he was going to put into his bomb site. And before they before they could arrive at the target to make their bomb run, Behan took Farabee and myself to a planned layout of this situation on the operations wall, and he said, this is where that bomb is going to hit, and he had a, he had drew an X mark at short and left by 1,700 feet. Behan missed it by 100 feet. They were 1,600 feet short and left, which didn't help the Air Force much. Yes, ma'am. I would like to know uh, just a few little personal things. Do you have any children? How long have you been married? And I'd like for you to introduce us to your lovely wife. Well, the answer is yes, we've got children. Uh, there are three boys involved. Andrea and I were each married before. She had one boy, and I had two. Uh, her son got a, a daughter, nine years old. I've got five grandchildren from two boys. One of them has three and one of them has two. The oldest boy is 16. The oldest girl is, is all, well, he's 17. Cause yeah, he's had a driver's license now for, <laughs> he, he's had a driver's license well over a year. So the, the girl just got hers. So she's 16, he's 17. There's only a year difference between the two of them. And uh, the uh, other girl in the same family is, what is she, 12 or 13? Stacy. Uh, Jean, the, my youngest boy, uh, Jean has a girl that is, is 16 because she got her driver's license this past summer. That's how I keep track of it. They want, the, they want Grandpa's Corvette. Gr Grant, Grandpa solved that problem. He sold it. Uh, Anyway, the the the, the other the other boy is uh, he's sissies. Gina's sixteen and Chuck is twelve, and Jimmy's girl, that little girl, is nine years old. I must say that 
Andrea and I have undertaken something that, uh, I don't know, we're having a good time. We are having the granddaughter live with us this year because we got a grandniece from France that's living with us and going to school so she can learn English. The granddaughter gets to learn French. Grandma gets to translate homework three or four different ways. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> Are you really tired? Huh? Are you okay? Uh, we're we're we don't want to wear you out. Look at uh, I uh, I don't wear easy. I don't want to believe me. I don't want to bore you. But I said, Andrea and I are spending the night here. It's very seldom to go to bed before midnight. Uh, <laughs> if you can endure it, I can, because I as I told the doctor. Uh, I expected to have more fun out of this than you folks. <laughs> this man is not one to uh, make understatements, but I was looking in his book here. He was quoted in the Tibbet story as saying, describing the time when he met Andrea in France about 1947. Uh, no, 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 no. We were in the 50s then. All right, in the 50s. And he's, he described her as saying she's very charming and intelligent. That's an understatement, and I'd like for her to stand and you to meet Andrea Tibbetts. You'll see how beautiful she is. A couple of more questions. We won't be much longer. Uh, yes. Uh, in your outfit, uh, how many of the B-29s were capable of carrying atom bombs? How many of your 15? All of them. As a matter of fact, we had 18 airplanes that were capable. I left, I left three of them in Wendover, Utah. I left one to carry the next bomb out. I left two to continue working with the scientists back there on some of the experimental stuff that we're doing. Those airplanes, by the way, they were, they were the, built by the Martin Airplane Plant at Omaha. And I've had Boeing engineers tell me that Martin built the best B-29 was ever built by anybody. Martin, Martin had the reputation of being the best manufacturer. They had the reputation of being the worst designer. Hey, let me, let me tell you a story. Speaking of, speak, speaking, of, speaking of Martin airplanes, and with all due respect to the lady pilots in here, do you remember the Martin B-26 airplane, or have you heard about it? That's it. They had they had all kinds of names for it. They called it a vagrant, you know, because it had no visible means of support and all that kind of stuff. The Martin airplane was the first airplane to come out with what we call a high lift wing. Thin airfoil, high lift wing. Now, the saying was, and it was almost true, one a day in Tampa Bay. <laughs> because that's where the first B-26 uh, transition took place, was at Tampa, Florida. When you got into the, you crawled up into the airplane, you crawled up at the rear section of the, right underneath, just behind the wing, you went up inside to get up into the fuselage of it, and on the way up on your right side was an electrical panel. It had the generator switches on it, it had circuit breakers, a few things. You were supposed to energize, or you were supposed to turn the generators on at that particular time when you crawled up to go in the, in, get into the cockpit to start pre-flight and take the airplane off. Now, people got to do this, put the generator switches on. The airplane had electrical props on them. So, most cases, and it had dual batteries in it, but most of the times you had just enough electrical power in your batteries to get the engines cranked up, to taxi, use your radios to get your taxi instructions, be given a clearance to take off, and get just about 20 feet off of the ground when you had no electrical power. Your props went flat and you went down. That's why they went into Tampa Bay. There's another reason. The airplane with the high lift wing, it had to have a high angle of attack, which means a nose high attitude to take off. Our pilots, we didn't understand this. Nobody explained it to us because we had always been flying underpowered airplanes with large airfoils on them, slow, but they had lift off of the ground and they just came up like this. But because they didn't have much power, 
your instructors or anybody that was checking you out in one of these airplanes said, now don't pull the nose too high because if you do, you're going to stall out. And so you'd be going along and you're trying to get, you know, go through this thing and get this up in the air and pretty soon you feel somebody push forward on the, on the yoke uh, and it's to get your nose down. The fellas started flying this airplane without that knowledge. When they got it, when they had all of the electrical power they needed to keep the props running and so forth and make a takeoff, they ran out of runway. So the first thing they did when they finally had no more runway left in front of this airplane wouldn't run down the runway take off because it had a negative angle of attack on the ground. They'd pull back on the yoke and of course the airplane would go right up in the air. It was normal for that thing to have about an 18 to 20 degree uh, deck angle to, to properly climb it. It had the power to do it. So here's a guy sitting there and all of a sudden here's a nose up in front of me. Oh my God, I'm going to stall. So he pushes it down, pushes it down too quick. It's a heavy airplane. It goes into the ground and he wraps it up that way. It took a lot to learn. Okay, so it had a terrible reputation. I had been on the West Coast one time. After I got back from Europe, I was working with the B-29 deal. I'd been on the West Coast. I came back through Pueblo, Colorado. I had to stop fuel. I was flying a B-25. I had to stop for fuel. I stopped at Pueblo, pulled up in front of the operations the way I was signaled to, and just about the time that I was getting out of there, filling out the forms, getting out of the airplane, here comes the B-26, boom, right in front of me. And I saw this little head sitting in the cockpit. And uh, I, I looked and I thought, gosh, that's a small guy flying that airplane. And uh, next thing I see some legs coming down out of there wearing a blue flying suit. And I've got this line chief out there and I said, what's that? He said, that's a wasp. I said, what's a wasp? He said, a girl pilot. I said, what are they doing flying that B-26? He said, oh, they fly them all the time for tow target work. Well, that really got to me. <laughs> Here, here's these little girls flying a B-26 and all of these big guys are afraid of them. I, could, I couldn't rest until I got into a B-26. I had to find out what it is that makes somebody not want to fly a B-26. I got put in one quicker than I expected because I, got, I ran out of a plane one day at Marietta, Georgia and they had, I don't know, they had 20 of them sitting around there. I borrowed one to get to Wichita, Kansas. First time I'd ever been in it. But the thing was great. It was a fine airplane, stable. It was fast for an airplane those days. It was just a beautiful thing to fly, no problem at all. As a matter of fact, on my first flight, about 150 miles this side of Wichita, I lost the right engine. And uh, I had a couple of Boeing engineers with me, and we call in, trimmed out the airplane, flying along on one engine, and we come in to make a landing. One of the guys is a little bit of a nervous flyer, and he's sitting right behind me on a jump seat behind me. And uh, I'm bringing the thing in, turn on final approach. Fire trucks and every ambulances and all are out there because I told them I was coming in with one engine. We're getting down, I don't know, 200 feet or something, a quarter of a mile behind the run. He tapped me on the shoulder. He said, how do these things land on one engine? I said, I bet I know I never landed one on one engine. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway, he didn't ride with me again. <laughs> we had trouble, we had trouble with B-29s not being flown at Alamogordo by all of these big football heroes from all of the colleges all over the United States. They had a class of heroes that they had down there. They wanted to make B-29 instructors. These guys would get out, they'd crank up, they'd get out and run up an engine check on the end of the runway, come abort and come on back. So anyway, a general by the name of Barney Giles stopped me one day. He told me this story. I didn't know about it. He said, what can we do to make those airplanes get more utilization per day? He said, there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, the airplanes. And I said, well, I don't know, but I got an idea. And he said, what was that? And I told him the story about the girls in the B-26, and I had to fly one. So he smiled. He said, do you think you can do it? I said, I can train two to fly that airplane without any problem. He gave me a green light. I got two girls. One by the name of Dora Doherty and the other by the name of Dee Dee Mormon. And I took them to Birmingham, Alabama at the Mod Center so we'd have all the 29s that we needed and we could just fly and fly and fly. And I worked those girls over for about five days. Dora was an excellent pilot. You could teach, show her something once and she could do it next time. There was no problem. 
and she wasn't the least bit concerned about it. My flight engineer, after two or three rides with him, he said, hell, I'll buy with a girl in time. I said, good. We cheated a little bit because I knew that with certain weights, the airplane would fly on three engines with a little less weight, it'd fly on two engines. So I got the girls all checked out to where they would take the B-29, they'd start down the runway, and as soon as it broke ground, they'd feather the board engine. And once they got the wheels and the flaps tucked up, they feathered the other one right beside it, climbed on out on two engines. Oh, I'm telling you, I didn't do these guys' laundry after they had the first ride, but I understand, I understand it was dirty. B-29 B started flying to beat hell. Were you satisfied with the presentation on television about the story about Enola Gay? Were you satisfied with the TV presentation about Enola Gay? I would have to tell you yes, because first off, I didn't have anything to do with the production of the film. I did get to put in my say-so on the script. They had, unfortunately, had three different writers that started on that thing. The first one died, the second one quit or something, I don't know. But the, by the time they got through with it, uh, I thought they, I, with the corrections that were suggested, the producers wanted to do as good a film as they could do. The next thing is that I understand later from the producers that the young actors that they hired to, to portray us in that film all volunteered to do it for less money than they were getting for doing other type of film work because they wanted to be in on it. They thought it was going to be a great picture. And the, the uh, director of the thing, when he got all through with it and I saw that, I told him, I said, man, you're more than a director, you're a magician. <laughs> because they had two B-29s, one of which wouldn't fly. And you saw the thing. The next thing is they made all of those pictures look like uh, uh, Japan and so forth. Well, that was at, at, at Magoo in California. What they had done is they got artists to paint pictures and do all of this stuff so that it looked like you were looking at a scene in Japan. They, they followed a reasonably accurate portrayal of incidents. They rearranged incidents to give the story a continuity that they wanted to, to give in the, in the film. So I think that that, uh, as I say, I think, you know, Patrick Duffy portrayed me. Uh, I talked to Patrick Duffy on one occasion, I don't know, three or four hours. I went to his house and spent some time with him. The only thing that I did as far as the film is concerned, I went to Tucson, Arizona, to Davis Monthan. That's where they did most of their filming. I went there because they wanted me to... <coughs> portray, act as an advisor for the so-called night takeoff. Nobody was sure exactly how that, what the sequence of events were, how the night takeoff took place and all that. So I went, went out there and was there the night that they made that filming. I got in the day before and I was there that night and left the next day. So that's as much as I had to do with it. But I, uh, as I say, I gave the producer when they asked me, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll give you, I'll give you 85 to 90 percent. That's his grade. We've neglected the right side. We'll take one more from over here if someone's question. I believe there was a man, Bill. Yes, Sheila. I understand your position. Loudly. Uh, in the year that you did what you did, having five dollars to you and the five dollars and whatever, how would you react if you were in a command position today? Would you accept the Sally Ride type person, or would you still to the fact that she was a particular set? With daughter, would you accept the Sally Ride type person if you were in command of an operation these days? I think that's yeah. She's speaking as a lady pilot with five daughters. <laughs> now you look at uh, the answer is yes, I would because I think that I was probably one of the first to advocate using these girls. Now, I didn't tell you, Dora and Dee Dee Mormon did a beautiful job flying the B-29, but when I went to Wendover, out there in, as Hope said, leftover, I had to get all my supplies out of the Oklahoma City Depot. 
When I sent mail crews to Oklahoma City from Wendover, Utah, airplane had more damn engine problems and trouble than you could possibly imagine. But if I said, if, and now Dee Dee Mormon was married to an Air Force pilot and she did not go to Wendover, a woman by the name, a young lady by the name of Mary Helen Gosnell joined us and went out there because she, she had been at Grand Island. And uh, so uh, D, uh, Dora had two. Dora's flying the C-46s uh, and B-17s at Grand Island. And uh, anyway, she and Mary Helen would take off from Wendover, Utah. They would fly to Oak City, which in a Goonie Bird, or later in the C-54. In a Goonie Bird, it was about a six-hour run. I could count on them being back in 18 hours. But, as I say, it'd be three or four days to get a mail crew back. <laughs> we, let's uh, bring an end to the questions as popular as they are. Um, General Tibbetts, I think you can recognize the enthusiasm of the crowd, and uh, we have been honored and uh, excited to have you here. I hope you don't consider this to be a demotion, but uh, we know that you're a Brigadier General. You're now a Colonel, uh, a Kentucky Colonel on the staff of Governor Arthur Lane Collins. We'd like you to have this. Oh, thank you. And uh, <laughs> also, if I may open this little box here, I'd like you to take this out and hold it up for the group. The opening is right there. I don't want it to bite me and have me No, dropping. sir. No, sir. This is a Kentucky Colonel Jewel Cup. Oh, and oh. Uh, when you accept a Kentucky Colonelcy and a Jewel Cup, you become one of us. I appreciate and it. And we'd I like for you to uh, come back and see us again. We Dr. do appreciate so much.